Today, I want to talk about the economic potential which can be derived from the economic partnership agreement which we have just completed. We negotiated this agreement over the last four years, and that was the schedule of negotiations. We were one of six regions of the African, Caribbean, and Pacific group to be negotiating with the EU. <clears throat> and I'm pleased to report, and this is a credit to the region, that we are the only region to finish an economic partnership agreement. <clears throat> we finished on time. We're in a region where punctuality is not highly regarded, but we finished on schedule. In addition, this is the most complex and comprehensive trade agreement ever done by CARIFORUM. We did it not only with CARIFORUM, but we did it with, in the framework of, we did not only did it with CARICOM, but with CARIFORUM, with a country whose population is larger than the rest of the CARICOM and whose economy is bigger. So we have brought to fruition the, the negotiations and we have an agreement which I am declaring to be a good agreement for us but the benefits are not going to automatically come to us. We have to be internationally competitive. It means that we have opened the door. Whether the region walks through that door or not is up to the region. It has to become interna more internationally competitive, and this has implications for national and regional policy. Remember also, we live in a competitive world. We're not the only people who want to walk through the door to the European market of 450 million high-income consumers. Everybody else in the world, whether they have an EPA or not, is looking to go through that door. So we need to make sure we seize the opportunity. Now, why, why do we do trade agreements? Um, the reason for doing trade agreements is that we are small countries, and we're living in a highly globalized world economy. And we need to bring some order to that globalization. Because when you are small, it's the law of the jungle. The big rule, the big consume, the small, take advantage of the small. But we can compete and survive. But one of the things we do in trade negotiations is mediate the encounter with globalization by negotiating some rules. We feel that this is good because it gets our agenda taken care of and recognized. Otherwise, you would have a free flow unregulated. The second reason that we in the Caribbean want trade agreements is that our economies are highly open. The process of growth is export driven and therefore access to markets are, is a critical factor in our economic growth. And the European Union is a vast and lucrative market. So for those two reasons, we want to do trade agreements. Now, why would we want to do one with the EU? It's simple. The European Union is a large, lucrative market of 50 million consumers. Secondly, we have had a long relationship with Europe. Europe is one of our main trading partners. In fact, 15% of our imports come from the European Union, and some of our critical exports have depended on those markets, in particular sugar and banana, and there is potential for us in that market. A third reason for doing the agreement to the European Union is that the preferential arrangements which we enjoyed for sugar and banana have been struck down by rulings in the WTO. And we wanted to salvage as much of the preferential arrangements as we could. And therefore, we wanted to move quickly to replace the existing trade arrangements with a new arrangement which would lock in the remnants of that preferential arrangement. And lastly, the trade component of the Cotonou Agreement had to come to an end December 31st, 2007. Why? 
it had preferential elements, and if it has preferential elements, it has to be given a waiver in the WTO. That waiver lasted from 2000 until the end of 2007. It had to come to an end. It was not, as many of the misleading critics have said, it's not something which could have been automatically extended or automatically renewed. We'd have had to go back to the WTO, make a case. This would have taken months, and this would have, there's no guarantee it would have been renewed. So it was not an option just to go on negotiating indefinitely, or because we're not happy with the erosion of preferential trade, that we can be in denial and just ask for it to be automatically extended. So that was not a, a, a possibility. And finally, <clears throat> if we had not completed the economic partnership agreement, our options were the following. One, we could have no agreement with Europe. Obviously, that's not desirable. We could, secondly, resort to the interim agreement. The interim agreement is an agreement for only goods. We felt that many of the future benefits are going to be in services and investment as well as goods. And we figured that if we had to do the difficult uh, part of liberalizing imports in goods, we should do it to get not just goods, but goods, services, investment, and everything else. So obviously, that's not a, the, the best option for us. And thirdly, we could have gone on to the European system for GSP. That would have entailed some products which were going in duty-free, paying duties and tariffs, and others paying much higher duties and tariffs. That would have injured our economy starting immediately in January, and it may have pushed us out of the market, and it's very difficult to recover your market position if you have been displaced. So none of the alternatives were palatable to us. We made the economic partnership agreement a priority as well because it was the best game in town in the sense that the WTO negotiations have been going along very slowly. The last round took nearly 10 years, and this round has all the stuff they didn't finish in those 10 years. So it's not an easy agenda. So that was moving along very slowly. We decided not to negotiate with the United States, and by the time we were thinking about it, the US no longer had trade promotion authority and could negotiate anyway. With the Canadians, we started a dialogue with them seven years ago. We haven't started to negotiate yet. Problems on both sides, but the point is, this was a priority for us because it was the best option at the time. Now, we also did the economic partnership agreement in a context and that context is one where there were a number of developments that we were not necessarily happy about, but you have to face reality. Some of the critics of this agreement are living in the past and wishing for a past that cannot come back. The world is not changing. It has already changed, and it's going to change. So we have to deal with reality. We can't bury our heads in the sand and hope for something which can no longer happen. In that regard, let us disabuse ourselves of some, some misconceptions. The first is that their small countries have no entitlement to aid. There's nothing that says anybody has to give small countries aid. We have become habituated to getting aid, and if you can get it, it's good. Fine, it adds to your resources and so on. But it's become a habit, and we are not going to automatically get aid. In fact, aid in real terms has declined over the last 20 years. Most of it is going to countries which are far poorer than us. And as middle-income developing countries, we're not likely to get back on that agenda. So we have to get off of this habit of development assistance.